Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. I am excited to be here with Daniel Patterson from Grow Your Music Studio. When I first met him on Clubhouse, I was just so excited at what he is doing because I work with so many musicians. I know many of you listeners and people who are watching here, uh, you may actually have a full-blown studio or you may be just doing music lessons on the side to make a little extra income, add in those extra income streams that I'm always talking about. And it doesn't even matter if it's a side hustle or a full-blown thing, you're going to learn a ton today from Daniel because he helps people, obviously, based upon his business name, grow their music studio. So uh, before we get into all of the tactical stuff that I know he's going to teach you today, I'd love to know, Daniel, what is your background in music? How did you get started? I know you mentioned you have taught piano. Like, How did you move from that into kind of helping musicians on the marketing side? Yeah, it's it's a good question. So I've played the piano since I was four years old, was um, taught in kind of a classical style. Uh, but as I moved into my 20s after college and getting an education degree in music and all this, um, you know, I did the playing and gigging. I, you know, played and sang at a piano bar and, and those sorts of things. Um, but my first love was always teaching. And I experienced that frustration of wanting to teach more and not wanting to do all these side gigs or, you know, playing at bar mitzvahs or playing at Nordstrom on the piano, which I did all those things, but just to teach. And so true to, I guess, my personality, I get obsessed about stuff. Um, and so I obsessively started studying marketing in, in those first five years that my studio was in business. And, uh, got into the online marketing world. And, and to be honest, a lot of the stuff that we have to do in online marketing, it's really overpowered for running a local studio. So I very quickly grew my studio to a big size. Mm -hmm. um, got into group lessons. And then at a certain point in, in some of the teacher organizations I was in, people actually started coming to me and asking, how are you doing this? And it led to me starting to do, um, you know, gig work, building Google ads accounts for people. And then it led to the blog um, and the videos and, and all these things, uh, you know, and now, you know, Growing Music Studio started in 2016. We've now served over 600 studios around the world, um, Australia, mostly North America, Europe, Middle East, um, you know, East Asia, just almost everywhere. And uh, it, it all kind of came from this idea that I discovered what I felt was a secret as it turned out, it wasn't, but I felt like I had discovered this secret, like here's how you get students. And I just wanted to share that with a lot of people. So I know that wasn't the most brief of stories, but that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the genesis of how all this came about. No, that's perfect. And I mean, I love that. Like you said, I, I thought it was a secret. And I think that's a, a really important point because like you said, you said, you know, the online marketing world, like is, Oh, like, overpowering right marketing wise to help you locally and i think a lot of people don't realize that they think well i'm only doing stuff locally and yes. how can the online world help me because then you know i'm i'm trying to market to everyone but obviously we we know how to like niche it down right to the local place yes but i love that you said you know you thought it was a secret because of the fact that a lot of local studio owners don't even think to go online they're doing all the old school and there's nothing wrong with the old school ways of you know going out to local music teachers and you know putting up flyers at libraries and you know all the things yeah. that we do right as local teachers which are all great but they can only go so far and especially now 
when people yes. are online, especially now after 2020, when pe even more people are spending more time online and are used to this world, um, I think it's a perfect time to talk about this. So I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it would be cool to kind of go over like what you help people with by talking about a case study that you sure. mentioned to me, uh, somebody that you help basically triple the size of their local studio, which yeah. I was like, wow, that's amazing. Um, so yeah. why don't you get into that? And then we can like stop along the way and, and hit a few points. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you made such a good point there about with that idea, the distinction between online and local. And I think the best way to set the story up is maybe with a little bit of an image and, and a thought to, to give people context for the story. I, this movie is 40 years old now, but I think most people have seen it. But in the first Indiana Jones movie, there's this scene where there's this guy with a sword and he's like doing all this fancy sword work and Indiana Jones pulls out a pistol and shoots the guy. It's like, he was really overpowered in that fight, okay? <laughs> That's what online marketing is in a local market. And this is, this is the context, is that if you're competing globally, you have global competition. You're, you know, on a scale of one to 10, your chops probably have to be eight, nine, 10 to compete, you know, at that level. But at the local level, the odds of the best business person in the world being one of your quote local competitors, which I don't even think that's the best terminology. We don't have to be competitive. There's more than enough people out there that would love to learn music if we would just give them a chance and, and be visible to them. But the odds of, you know, <laughs> the, um, the best business person in the world being the competitor down the street it is very unlikely. And so if you bring much more sophisticated tactics to that local business, uh, odds are, and I think my career and, and the person I'm about ready to talk about, I think is a good demonstration of how of how that plays out. So I could jump into that story if you'd like. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So it was a couple of summers ago, I had written a blog post and for the blog, my blog. And as usually happens, whenever I would do that and promote it, I would get kind of a, a flood of you know inquiries or people just reaching out or you know, responding to emails that I'd sent out, that sort of thing. One of these was a young lady out in Los Angeles. Um, at the time she was 25, 26 years old. And she was building her YouTube audience. She was doing, uh, you know, local clubs. She was doing covers. She was writing her own music, performing that. And she wasn't at the place in her career yet where she was fully supporting herself on that. And so she was teaching on the side and she contacted me because she wanted to grow her student base. She wanted to get to a certain income amount. She said, can you help me do that? And her goal at the time, she said, I want to go from three to $6,000. So over the course of uh, five, six months, you know, I did some coaching work with her. She, you know, implemented all these things. And, and what, we, what we worked on was the seed of an idea that she was already working on. We just fleshed it out in a lot more detail. And it was this, that she wanted to charge above market rates for LA. Hmm. And my suggestion was, well, we have to really define the programs that you're offering your studio. Cause she was already offering some packages. Her, her basic thesis was if I want to charge above market rates, I should, I should have programs that cost way more than that to kind of position myself. And what we did together was really tighten up her copy, um, tighten up the sales funnel that she had in the studio, uh, improve the offers in those various programs. And, you know, the result of that was about nine months later, she had tripled her income from, you know, 3K to 9K per month. And what's interesting, I think this is just a, an awesome PS to the story, is that she told me originally her plan was to, to have these high level packages to, to position her. So I think she had one at like 240 a month. She had one at 300, 400, 500, 600. She had like these various packages. She never intended mm. to sell those high ones. She ended up within a year having four people at that $500 mark. <laughs> but it wasn't as if she just said, oh, hey, here's some lessons. They're $500. She did a lot of work. We did a lot of work together, like really thinking about her positioning, how, how her copy should be, what her sales funnel should look like, looking at 
um, how people were interacting with her website. And um, so it wasn't as if she just slapped a sticker on the side of the box and said, oh, that'll be $500, please. No, she put a lot of thought into it. But I think, you know, instead of just, you know, advertising boring music lessons, you know, she built a brand around her lessons. Um, she had specific messaging. She really spoke to the kinds of things that her target audience really wanted. Um, she had, you know, distinct offers and, you know, she had those price tiers. So it, yeah, it's just- Yeah, let's uh, unpack that because I want to talk about, so did she, was she very clear at the beginning of like who her perfect student was? Did you work on that with her to like get very, you know, did she know and then she wasn't just messaging that well enough or did she have to like really be like, no, I really love to work with this student? That's interesting because she specifically wanted to work with adults. Mm. She was open to working with kids. And I think she did have some younger students, but everything about her website was very focused on reaching adults who had either never taken lessons, but wanted to. And then her higher tiers were really positioned more towards people who wanted to build a career in music as well, or perhaps they were a performer already and they wanted to get better at performing things of that nature. So she had, so again, those offers were distinct um, and depending on how she advertised or what she was advertising, her ads, you know, might look very different. Her copy looked very different because she was advertising something extremely distinct, not again, just something generic. So she knew who her target audience was. She knew what their thoughts were. Um, we had discussions around things that they said to her. I, I had her run a survey inside of her studio. We poured over that data, the responses that we got back from those folks. She, she had conversations with friends that weren't even considering having you know, taking lessons, but just trying to get the perception of what lessons for an adult would even be like so she could address that in, in her copy and her advertising. I love that. And I'm a, a big fan of doing that kind of market research and actually talking to people and, you know, asking very specific questions so you can get their language around it. Mm -hmm. um, so then what, so what kind of offers did she create here? Did she you know, what was distinct about the different packages that she had and how was she marketing those specifically? You know, the, I'd say the, the main difference was just the amount of time they would get with her. Hmm. So in the higher tiers, so in, you know, in the lowest tier, it was a pretty standard lesson package. Of course, we didn't advertise as such. We did make it sound really great. We really positioned her well. And out of respect to her, there's like taglines that I could say here, but you know, she worked hard to come up with those taglines, that sort of thing. So I don't want to expose her branding too much because, you know, it's really worked for her over the long term. But she she went beyond platitudes. You know, you look at a lot of music websites and they'll say things like explore our classes or discover the love of a lifetime or we inspire our students. <laughs> Follow we your passion. Students. Yeah, yes. I know. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and even even some of the things that I've said over the last five minutes could be construed as general advice you know, build an offer, you know, you can't go two minutes on Facebook or Instagram. If you're in some sort of business itch without getting an ad from another business person out of, out there, that's giving that general advice. And there's nothing wrong with that general advice. The problem is most people don't make the connection on how to use that general advice specifically. Mm -hmm. So the marketing for most music studios or music based businesses is really, really general. And that's why we get those platitudes. Um, you know, we have kind and caring teachers here or, you know, creative, kind teacher. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't promise anything. That doesn't promise a result to the student. And people don't want general platitudes. They want to know what they're going to be able to do. So the best marketing is always specific. And, and so what we did was build really specific marketing. And again, without getting into specific examples that she gave, I could, uh, you know, I could give examples that, that I would say generally, uh, could could describe what I'm saying specifically. In other words, I'm being very general here, but I could get into specifics if, if you'd like. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you were going to advertise to, let's say your target market, you really, you really want to work with kids or teens. Okay. Here's an angle you could take to come up with something that's more specific. So instead of just lessons from, you know, kids and teens or unlock the potential that your teenager has. Okay, here's an angle you could take. Ask this question. Who is responsible for the bad thing that your lesson program solves? So in other words, people are, are recruiting 
a solution when they buy into your business. Okay. So find a villain that the parent would identify as a villain and write a hook or an angle or something specific that paints them as the bad guy. Okay. And I know this has nothing to do with music necessarily, but that's the point. We're drawing in parents with what's relevant to them for these, for these teen students that we're trying to get in our studio. Maybe we have a real passion to help teens who would also have a career in music. Maybe we want, we want to nurture and shepherd them up to be great musicians too. So we're not going to do it with vague platitudes. What we could, what we could write is, is Fortnite turning your teenage son's brain to mush. Mm. That is a headline that's way better. And again, has nothing to do with music. But it's the attention grabber that would draw parents into an ad or to actually help them feel like that the, the website, that the studio website that they're on is actually relevant to them. You know, is your daughter spending too much time on social media to, you know, to, uh, you know, to do something useful with the time? You know, I, I think that one's a little more vague, but I think you see the point that I'm getting. And obviously either one of those things could, could apply to the other, but that's, um, th that's a way that I would, would make those more specific. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's you absolutely you need to you need to poke at the pain a little bit of, yes. of the person that you're trying to prompt to invest in what you're offering. And that's not I think that was something that weirded me out at first when I started doing marketing. I'm like, is that, you know, being mean to them? Is that mm. like, um, you know, is persuasion bad? And, you know, over the years, I'm like, no, like sometimes we don't even know what we want at first. We yeah. need to be shown the solutions that are going to help us. We might not even realize we have this problem until, you know, someone says, is Fortnite turning your child's brain to mush? And then you right. say, oh my gosh, my kid is spending five hours a day on Fortnite. Why am I not doing anything about this? Yes. You know, but they maybe that wasn't coming to the front of their mind because they were busy doing other things. And, and that really is a problem that they have. They're just not realizing yet. So I think that's a really, really great point that you make about the whole, you know, pain points in your marketing and, and talking to the right person. Like I, I know that, you know, some people might be tempted to talk to the teenager, right? Because they're the person right. that's getting the lessons, but let's just be honest. They're not the person paying for it. Right. 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 So you could, you know, you could get the attention of a teen, you know, perhaps in a different way, but that messaging would be much, much different. And it's probably more effective to go for the parent anyway. And I think maybe just to not saying that we need to wrap this point up, but, but, but what could be considered a final thought potentially would be the idea that um, we don't just have to focus on that pain. There's other, there's other things that we could, uh, that we could focus on. I'm um, even thinking about the specific type of student. So another angle to take would be like a specific type of student that might benefit from the lesson program, write something specific for that customer. And again, it might not appeal to everyone, but it would appeal to a certain a certain parent again if you're going after a child or a teen is your child so a, a potential headliner hook could be is your child so shy they can't look their classmates in the eye mm. and again and I, this is how i wanted to end addressing what you said there because i think it's such a good point i do think people feel weird at first speaking this way um i've had plenty of clients say "Ooh, i feel weird saying that using persuasion but the truth of the matter is is that we all know what we should be doing. We all know that we should be, you know, quote unquote, eating this way or doing these activities or investing this much in our IRA. Like we all know that stuff, but inertia often bogs us down. Mm -hmm. And I think the wake up call, either for the adult student who's getting older, you're, hey, you know, life's only going to get busier. <laughs> If you're advertising for adult students in their 20s, hey, life only gets busier after your 20s. Mm -hmm. Now's the time to join the studio. Now's the time to pursue that dream. Now's the time to pick back up that skill that you were pursuing when you were younger but didn't appreciate back then. I think, I think it's actually a service to people to, to tell the truth to them. And, and that's what I think this is. Oh, abs I absolutely agree with that. But it does take a little bit of education on our part as marketers when we first start out to realize that that's the case. Absolutely. Yes. So how, let's, <laughs> let's move into how can we use social media to get this message out there? Like what are the best ways? Um, and I know you do hmm. both organic and you know, yeah. paid ads. Yes. Um, have experience, um, pretty extensive experience in both. I think 
let's yeah let's talk about the proper use of social media how it fits into promoting a music lesson business uh and maybe most importantly how to avoid it how to avoid making it just an endless treadmill mm. of hoping this works okay and yeah. the um in in really thinking about this in really thinking about this topic recently i came up with with a thought is that we need to treat social media like a vending machine not a wishing well mm. in other words if you go to a wishing well you take the coin you take the money you throw it in the well and hope that the universe gives you your wish and if it doesn't you've probably even forgotten that you threw it in the wishing well you know whereas if you go to a vending machine and you put the money in and it doesn't give you what you want you're actually a little bit upset <laughs> this isn't working the way it should and so there's this angst that comes up like, ah, I'm, I'm mad. You know, you, you think um, I, I was watching the TV series uh, Killing Eve recently and um, uh, great show. Phoebe Waller-Bridge did it. Um, one of the producers, she's awesome. And there's a scene in there where, you know, someone, they can't get the thing out of the vending machine and they're, you know, they're beating on the vending, vending machine. That is the way that I would want people to approach social media. You should actually expect a measurable result from social media. And I think so many people get caught in this treadmill of, oh, I just got to keep putting content out there and eventually it will work. That's not it. Again, the way most people treat social media is like that wishing well. There's this vague feeling that you get to churn out content. Um, it's going to somehow bring business or students or fans or Spotify listens or likes or those sorts of things. No, you need to have a defined evidence of success. You need to make an offer. Um, each post that you make needs to be supporting a goal. You need to measure against that goal. You need to actually make sure if you're getting to that, and if you're not, if your social strategy isn't helping you get to that goal, then you need to re-examine that. I don't want to just sound like a contrarian. You know, I think most people know this fellow, but you know, guys like Gary Vaynerchuk have popularized the idea that you have to co post constantly on social media for attention. And I don't disagree with him, but I think you have to look at the context of what he's trying to do. He's trying to get people just to act. Most people are being perfectionistic with their content and that's kind of Gary's messaging, but even he isn't posting on social media just to post every day. He's got a goal that he's after and he's apparently, you know, hitting that goal quite a lot because he's still doing it. Mm -hmm. If he wasn't still getting something out of what he's doing, he would not be posting. And the truth is when he went from making daily V to weekly V, I guarantee you that was in response to his content, not performing as well as it once did. You know, he was filming that daily show for nearly two years and then he went to a more sporadic basis and he's just not as loud as he used to be. But but I, again, I think the idea is treat it like a vending machine. You want something specific out of it. Be very clear about what you specifically want and then measure against that goal. That is the best way to treat social. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think where artists and musicians get stuck is that they understand, okay, if my call to action is to buy or join my Patreon or, right. you know, get a sample lesson or whatever it is, they can measure that. But like, mm. you can't have that be your goal for every post. So what mm. other kinds of calls to action or things that you can measure, can you have kind of along the journey of your customer? Hmm. I think that goes back to the story I told you earlier about in the case study is that understanding what that top level motivation and goal is of your target audience, understanding what that is, and then making your top level content, you know, maybe not quite as much of a pitch, but drawing them in with the headlines, you know, the, the, the images, the videos, specifically for a music lesson business, obviously it's going to be different for, you know, if you're promoting, you know, uh, your act or a band or, or that sort of thing, that, that's going to be different. That's going to just be on the creative itself. And in that sense, putting out a lot of material does make a lot of sense. Um, but even, even in that sense, measuring throughput in the funnel will tell you an awful lot about the kinds of things that your audience wants to hear, whether it's music or whether it's advertising for lesson program, you're going to know what works and then you double down on that stuff. Yeah. And, and I'm always, you know, trying to encourage people that I work with to, to always keep track of their numbers because mm. your numbers are going to tell the story. 
And a lot of times people are just like, I don't know what numbers to keep track of, or I'm just like numbers stress me out or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I know you've, you've got some numbers that you think that everybody should be watching. Yeah. Um, specifically if you're promoting music lessons, a music lesson business, whether you're doing it on the side, want to do it full time, these sorts of things, it's, the potential is there for things to be very complex or very simple. And that's kind of what I was talking about a minute ago. I'd prefer things to be simple. And so the story I'd tell you is that in my own music lesson business, um, I was a single teacher studio. I taught group lessons. I promoted a very specific group lesson offer. Um, I had fluctuating between 95 to hundred students for many, many years before I, you know, kind of shut that down and did this full time. Um, which is a tough decision, but nonetheless, it was a decision I made. But during those years that the studio was, you know, full bore, full capacity, it was just me seeing 9,500 students a week in groups. To maintain that studio size and, you know, work that 20 to 25 hours a week, all I had active for me was Google ads, you know, some organic things I was doing in Google as well, but I never formally or officially did SEO. I just made sure that I was listed in directories and that's about it. I was on Google Maps, I was on Google My Business, I was using Google Ads. I would send that traffic all to my website. It was a very simple four page website, very clear offer. You know, you heard some of the headline examples I was giving earlier. I was speaking in those really evocative, emotional terms, making bold promises about what I could do. And they were not empty promises. They were based on things that I saw my average student doing made very clear what, what they were going to get out of the experience. And the reason for the simplicity was that website needed to only do one job. And that was to get them to contact me. It wasn't to get them to be impressed with me. Wasn't to get them to know where I went to university. Wasn't to promote, you know, at, for part of the time I was doing, I, I was, you know, doing live performance. Wasn't to promote any live performance. One job. I want them to want this. And I want them to contact me. And so everything on that site pointed towards get in touch with me. It was very clear what they were going to get and what they were supposed to do next. And then from that point, there was nothing sophisticated in the back end either. There was no like crazy automation funnel. Literally people filled out a simple contact form. I would get their info and then I would contact them as quickly as I could and, and get them in for an intro lesson. And that whole intro lesson was scripted as well. It was, it almost, be, yeah, I mean, it was basically a script for me. I would vary, but there were some definite messaging points that I was trying to get across in that. Obviously, you know, I would finish working because I only worked with children. Um, I would finish working with the ch child. I'd turn to the parent, you know, they would have like this bright look on their face because I just saw how easy it seemed to be for their kid, which it wasn't always like that. I think as I got better as a teacher, I made it look easy, even though, it was still the same intro lesson. Um, and uh, from that point, do you want to join? And it was almost always a yes. I, I can count on one hand in a decade how many people ended up not signing up once they'd gone through that experience. It, it was designed to overwhelm them with the idea that they were going to have a, their child was going to have a really good time here um, and that it was a high quality education. And I did promote my lessons as fun and casual. And I, still had 60% of my fun and casual students performing in a, in a worldwide achievement program where they were like getting tested and graded against a worldwide standard. So I was, you know, it's that classic, um, it was that classic image or analogy of, you know, you, if you want to give your pet like their heartworm pill, you put it inside a piece of cheese, you know, and they'll just gobble it up. But if you just try to give them the pill, no one wants it. That's unfortunately what most studios do. They just say, hey, here's the pill, take it. They don't wrap it up in something much nicer. So I'm giving them something good, but I'm giving in a package that is a very, very easy yes for parents. And the kids are leaving, they're beaming, they feel like a million bucks. Um, it's hard to say no to that. That's awesome. I love, I love all of those examples. So getting back to the numbers, um, one of them I'm assuming is how many people are signing up for a sample lesson. And then would another number mm. important to watch would be the percentage of people sure. that are then signing. So there are four numbers primarily that I'd recommend any studio number, uh, studio owner keep track of how many people are visiting your website, 
how many people are actually reaching out to you on your site or if you're using landing pages you know you get a little more sophisticated and use something like click funnels or go high level or lead pages one of these but I, I don't think for most single teacher students you might not even have to go farther than just having a simple four to five page website nothing more than nothing more fancy than that so how many people are actually finding your site how many people are reaching out to you um, from your site how many of those people you're actually getting in touch with because people will reach out to you and then disappear off the face of the planet it's just the cost of doing business mm -hmm. at best if 10 for every 10 people that reached out to me for lessons i would maybe get in touch with five or six you know and i get studio owners contact me all the time like oh all these people contact me but they don't ah, it's just the way it is people they're not it's that inertia I talked about earlier. And then the yeah. final number, the fourth number would be how many people actually sign up. So if someone, if you actually get in touch with someone, have a phone conversation with them, have a Zoom conversation with them potentially in this day and age, um, or they come in for a, a lesson, an intro lesson, most of those people should be signing up. If not, it's probably a sign that they're not feeling that excitement and, and that messaging probably needs to be worked on. You probably need to employ some really powerful stories, you know, and, and that's something I would do with parents. I would, I would uh, tell stories of other students, obviously not by name. I want to protect people's privacy, but I would in general tell stories of students in the studio or what they were doing, or I had tons of student performance videos all over my social channels, kids just doing really amazing things. And uh, I, I would use all of that in the, uh, in the process of recruiting students in the studio. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Stories are so stories are so powerful. But what's great about those numbers is then you can look from one number to the next and take a percentage and be like, okay, this many people are visiting my site, but only this many people are filling out the form. What right. do I need to do to my site to make more people fill out the form? Do I have enough calls to action? Do I have enough yeah. direct messaging that's really speaking to them? You know, so I, I love that you mentioned all of those numbers because then you can see okay, from this one to this one, I'll, if I could just improve this percentage by one or 2% even, I would have so many more people eventually hitting the mark on actually signing up. Yeah. So let me ask you this question about websites. Um, nowadays, people are like, why do I need a website? I can use Instagram. You know, people can DM me on Instagram and I can have a whole conversation there. Do you think people still absolutely need a website or can they just do social media or can they is the best way to just have them work in tandem really good question i'm going to give a multifaceted answer here <laughs> but try to be brief right i think if you're running paid advertising you need a home base to send someone to you actually need to send those people to an offer it's going to be difficult at the top of an instagram profile to have a really robust offer there mm. You can, you know, you can DM people. That's actually a strategy that I teach people, but where are you sending them to? So even if you're DMing people on Instagram, which, or Facebook, which I have students, sorry, I have clients <laughs> that literally built their studio from the ground up, never even getting into ads, doing exactly that strategy. But in the course of that conversation, you have to have a home base to send them back to. If for no other reason that, Instagram DMs, Facebook DMs don't have calendaring software in them. If for no other, no other reason, you have to have a place where they can literally sign up on a calendar to meet with you. So there needs to be a home base. And for my money, a website is, is a good home base. I think someone could get away with, you know, a one page website. I've had clients have only a one page website, not much more than a landing page. You could totally do that. You could have a landing page, but some place where they can see your offer, see what makes you unique, see social proof, which again, you can get on the Instagram profile, but once they see the social proof, where's the thing that they're going to, to say, yes, I want to be involved with that. You have that link right there in your bio. You can put a link tree link there. You could put a landing page link there. You could put your website link there, but I think some place for them to really be able to investigate you, that's going to be important. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think I think everybody needs a website and a place to send people. Now, you know, playing devil's advocate, you could just have a scheduling link that you send them directly through DMs and they never even have to go to the site. But I still say that you need that 
because of taking advantage of, as you mentioned, like people might be Googling your name, people, 100%. you know, might be Googling lessons in my, near me or whatever. And so, you know, you need to be able to have a place they can go from Google. Um, but so let's just say we've got many musicians here that probably already have a website as a musician. Interesting. So is, is there a problem? I know you mentioned like yours is only this, right? Only lessons. You didn't mix it in with all your music stuff, but is there a big problem with say, I have a brienoble.com and it's my music site. And then I wanted to have brienoble.com slash lessons. And it was a tab on my site. Do you think that that's an okay way to go? Okay. Are you saying that's actually what you did or are you just using that as an example? I did not do that. No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, an example, because so, I do have students yeah. that do are multifaceted and do have tabs on their website like that. I'm going to give the the simple blunt answer first and maybe provide some context points along with it, because there's always there's shades of gray in every truth, you know, mm -hmm. in every case where I've had someone who had multiple things that they were promoting, whether you know they had a wedding band or they were they had a solo career. Um, that sort of thing. In every case where we split those two things into two different sites, their response rate on their website went up in every case. So I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm just saying that for the for the average person like me, I think it's I think it's the better part of wisdom to do that. the The shade that I was talking about a second ago would be if you're such a well known quantity if you have like mini celebrity status and people are searching you out by name, not finding you because they typed in piano lessons or guitar lessons or vo vocal coach. And then they happen to come upon you. If someone is searching you out by name, then it probably doesn't matter. Hmm. But if, if the way people are discovering you is through a general search and they're shopping for a teacher, then we want to provide as few distractions as possible. I'm glad you said that because I totally agree with you. Um, my one caveat would be, hey, if you're just starting to do lessons and it's going to hold you back to go create a whole nother website right now, sure, put yes. a tab on your website, get 100%. started, right? And then when you get into the mode of like, I'm really going to market this thing, then you move to the big website. The yes. Website. Yeah. And I think that goes back to um, that comment I made briefly about Gary Vaynerchuk earlier, which is just do something, you know, mm -hmm. again, his, his, his whole messaging is just, I think, to get people to stop second guessing, to stop trying to build something perfect. I think what you said there is, is absolutely valid. Um, there's real wisdom in that. The idea that if, it, if it's between nothing <laughs> and, and a site that's promoting multiple things, then go ahead and do that but just realize that we don't want to stop there. Yes, I yeah. totally agree. But I think people get caught up in the like, oh, wish I have a web, I have a Banzoogle website. Should I get another Banzoogle website? Should I do a WordPress? You know, and they just get yeah. all in this cycle of like indecision. And I don't want you guys doing that. So just put it on your site for now. Know that you're going to, and it's going to be worth it because once you're really focusing on it and wanting to really market your studio, you can afford to pay the extra $200 a year or whatever for this mm. website. That's because it's going to generate that. Like he said, in every case, it did better when they yeah. had a website that was specifically for that. So you probably generate that just by getting one more student. So mm. it's totally worth it. Um, I wanted to go into, let's say people already have a studio and it's okay. doing well. Like I have several friends that are like maxed out. They're on wait Love list. It. You know, how can they scale that more. I mean, obviously one way is to go online, which I've talked about on here and doing online lessons, but how can, what are some other ways that they can scale that when you're kind of maxed out on one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. So I think there are two primary ways. And I think there are some other ways that are coming to the fore right now. Let me just briefly mention those. And then if we want to jump into any of those, I'm fine to do that. Obviously there's group lessons. I'm a huge proponent of that. Second is hiring other teachers. I've done that in the past. I prefer group lessons, <laughs> you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but I was working part-time in my own studio. I was working part-time hours, literal part-time hours, like 20 to 23 hours a week and making six figures because I was doing group lessons. And so for me, 
the hassle of needing to get a commercial location and hire people and have to deal with state law and federal law around employment and all this stuff, liability. It just made a lot. So for the 16 years that I taught, <laughs> I taught out of the front room of my house for the bulk of those um, and just carried like a general liability policy that, you know, that covered business use of my home, which is shockingly cheap actually um, in the grand scheme of things and um, much preferred that. So I think for someone that, you know, they do want to be dual career where they're promoting, uh, you know, a musical career to be, to, to have all those extra things to think about in terms of a location and staff and all those other things that compare that to group lessons. I'm going to say group lessons almost every single time there might be instances, unless someone's wanting to really go for it. You don't manage people and a location and a thriving music as a business as a part-time gig. I just don't, I don't think you do that. I know a few people who do, but they're on the other side of a big complex process where now they're on the other side of that complexity and they're back down to simplicity. Mm -hmm. So one of my actual very first client ever, there's a case study on my blogger and her name's Caitlin. You can just Google grow your music studio, Caitlin. She was a, a an Atlantic public school, uh, Atlantic Atlanta public school teacher had two dozen students. We worked over a 12 week period. She doubled her studio. Um, she now has six or eight people working for her hundreds of students and the middle part of her journey, she was working like crazy, learning all these business things, these sorts of things. Um, and now on the other side of that, she's opening a second location. She has a studio manager now. She's not teaching. She's not the primary teaching teacher. And you know, I don't want to, you know, paint this rosy picture because I'm sure, you know, she has her stresses as well. I, I you know, I, I keep in touch with her. It's been five years since we worked together, but well, three actually, because she anyway. Irrespective of that, what I'm saying is, is that she's now at a place where she there's there's entire weeks where she hasn't gone in the studio and she has people running it for her. But to get to that place cost her an awful lot. And I don't see how that would be compatible with trying to do a second thing on top of that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I totally do. It's interesting because I had someone on the podcast. I believe she's also from Atlanta, Tara Simon. I don't know if you know her, but she did the same thing. Mm. she hired other teachers and, and she's expanded and, you know, because it was part of her mission that she really wanted to serve as many, as many kids as possible. Yes. Um, so I get that, but I also can say that, you know, managing people is not easy and, you know, they, they are representing you. So ultimately it's on you if they do yeah. something that doesn't, you know, yeah, you're responsible you for all that. like you said, state laws and all that. So I definitely think that the group thing is a much better option. Do you, yeah. how do you find that that works with pricing? Do, are people still willing to pay like a really healthy price when they know they're not getting one-on-one? -on -one? So that is what I spent a long time in my career working out. I think there's two things that probably jump to someone's mind when they think about it. For the parent, the thing that jumps to their mind is, oh, that can't be as good as one-on-one. -on -one. And I think for the teacher, they buy into that belief. Mm -hmm. And so they assume that they should discount a group lesson. Well, what I'll tell you is that if your marketing is good enough and your teaching is good enough, neither one of those things has to be true. And I was the highest priced teacher in my area teaching kids in groups of five. Wow. And I did not allow a beginner to come into the studio unless they came through one of my group programs because they actually went faster for any kid and there's no way to to go back in time and see but in the early days when i was very unconfident about it i would have kids that more or less same age same ability level they'd been on the same track in, in terms of their progress and development they were passing their books in roughly the same amount of time one kid stayed in one-on-one -on -one, one kid went to the group and the kid in the group just shot ahead of the other kid mm. and i found that to be true and i, I don't I mean, we could probably do an entire podcast on group lessons, so I'll, I'll maybe just cut it right here. But um, what I found to be true was that you can't separate the learning experience from the environment in which the learning experience is happening. It was so much less of a pressurized environment for a child mm -hmm. that they were more relaxed. It forced me to be a better teacher because here I'm having to juggle five kids. And 
here's the other thing, and this is really unusual, and this is kind of the unique contribution I've made to the music education world, is that there are not many group systems out there that are being taught that allow a teacher to teach multi-level groups. I did not have um, the kids that I taught, they weren't all the same level, they were mixed. Wow. So I would have a beginner in the same group as a kid who'd been in there four years. They were both, both having a unique educational experience, but there was a series of rules that I created for myself that allowed me to juggle the balance of that. But what had to change was me. I had to become a much better teacher to, to handle those demands. And so what came out of that was um, a, a very unique group structure. And like I said, it, it's probably beyond the, the purpose of this <laughs> conversation to go into like exactly what all that entailed. But, but um, I would say that, you know, to answer the question, you know, that was originally posed, I think group lessons as a, as a format can be really advantageous over, you know, the complexity of, of the, of something bigger. Yeah. And I hope people that have thought about doing group are listening to what you're saying, because, you know, beyond getting the point across that you can charge more for group and you don't have to discount and all that. You have to believe that what you're yes. offering in group is just as valuable as one-on-one, yes. you know? And so you have to get yourself there first before you can do it. So I'm, I'm glad you, you said that and you gave some examples of people I, actually doing better. <laughs> early on, it might've been a little bit of an act of hubris to just leave them at the price that, that uh, my one-on-one -on -one lessons were at, but they were coming for an hour. The, the one-on-one -on -one kids were coming for a half hour, but right. I was seeing four kids in that hour in the group. Um, but over time, as I did have, as I improved and I saw the results, I thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm definitely raising the rates on this because every, everybody's loving it. Um, they're getting great scores on this international achievement scale. Um, parents knew it. And so there was buy-in, but there was a real strong self-belief that came, but it took a little while for that self-belief to be, you know, to show up for me. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So group is one way. I know you said you had a few more ways that people yeah. could scale. I think the third way, other than having other teachers teach for you, would be some sort of either completely online program or some hybrid program. And I think, man, this goes right back to, to, the, to the initial story, is that part of what um, that particular client did at the beginning in LA, part of what she did was she started creating training videos that uh, became a part of what they were buying into. She also made it, and, and this is one way to scale, if you, depending on how you define scale, but in her higher level packages, she actually allowed people to communicate with her via like a, a particular messenger app. You could use anything, Voxer, Slack, you could use WhatsApp. I mean, it, it doesn't matter which one, but she would allow people to communicate with her and they would send like little, like I'm struggling with this song and they'd send like a video clip to her and she would, she would, you know, teach them right there. She'd shoot a little selfie video and give them a tip. And that was part of the access that they got. Well, what she would do is she would do it during non-peak hours. She would handle those videos in, in a non-peak time where maybe, you know, if you're teaching kids and it's during the school year, you're not doing anything until three o'clock. Yep. You know, if you're teaching adults, some adults are available during the day, but most are gonna be coming after work hours. So if you save till mid morning, you know, a batch of videos that you got sent the night before to do that, that's a way to scale your time where that, that time might not have um, been as useful. And you're getting paid, you know, a premium amount to offer that service to people. So that's a way to scale. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the online course, I think this is the, the dream. A ton of people have approached me in the last year, especially with the pandemic. The music teaching industry really had to change over the last 18 months to, to stay in business. I know studios that went out of business because of the pandemic. I know other businesses that thrive because they made the switch to online really smoothly. <clears throat> and there's this thought of, well, hey, if I can teach a student online why couldn't i just teach an online course why couldn't i just record myself because the, the experience on their end is that they're seeing someone on a video screen why not just pre-record that material and so i think a lot of people have this thought of oh i'm gonna build i want to sell an online course around teaching an instrument or, or um, writing music or, or those sorts of things and this goes back to something i said earlier local competition is not as fierce mm -hmm as global competition. And so I would say that for the person who's wanting to, to scale using like an online course, just be ready for, just be ready for the, for the, the challenge level to go way, way up. 
because there's a there's an awful lot of people that are already there and doing it. And then there's an awful lot of people jumping into the mix wanting to do it as well. And again, I think a hybrid version could be maybe you don't want to go global with that. Maybe you build initially, you build something that's an online course just for your local market where it's a supplement to your traditional teaching studio where they're getting a value add and it caught, maybe allows you to not have to spend as much time with them or you get to charge a premium rate because you have that, you get your feet wet in the online course arena or the, um, the asynchronous instruction arena. And, and then from there, you can kind of move up to the big league, so to speak. That's exactly what I was thinking because mm. it is true that like, there are so many people coming out with courses right now. It's, it's crazy. And, and the marketing chops that you have to have to be able to compete, yeah. you know, someone like me, like I live and breathe marketing, you know, yeah. I have to, in order to get my stuff out there and compete. And you don't have time for that if you're teaching, you know, this many hours a week yeah. and all that. So I love the idea of the hybrid because you could then trade that for your time. So like yes. you said, you could maybe meet with the students only every other week or, you know, and, and give them a, an asynchronous assignment or have them go over a certain section on the weeks that they're not there and still charge the same. I, I think um, you didn't ask, but I'm going to go ahead and volunteer my opinion. I think the best way to scale, the best business model for a music lesson business is to hire, and it, sound, it might sound initially that I'm going back on what I said earlier, but I think you'll see where I'm getting to in a second, to hire someone else to teach group lessons for you. Hmm. You cannot beat that. Um, the studios that I've worked with, and our largest client last year, their studio did a million and a half dollars um, in revenue in one year. And a bit, uh, several large offerings they have and the many offerings that they have are group lessons. And the owner isn't teaching those. He's hired people to teach those for him. You know, And actually, it's a, it's a partner pair, a guy and a gal um, that own the studio together. Obviously, that big, there's going to be a lot of responsibilities to share. Um, I know it's going back a little bit on what I said earlier. So you know, if you, if you did have that desire to scale a little bit bigger than just doing groups yourself, but there are clients we've had in the past at least in, in, in my business where they started teaching group lessons themselves. The next step was for them to come in and mentor someone on how to do it, on how to teach group lessons, and then eventually start handing off and taking fewer hours themselves so that they could focus on other projects. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. And then you could build that online course that you want. Yes. And spend time focusing on that. But yeah, right. that's, yeah, that's a really, really good point. Okay, so man, we've covered so much during this and you've you've given so much of your secret sauce. Um, is there anything that you think that people need to know that we haven't covered before we finish up? Whew. No, I think we've we've really run the gamut. I, maybe just to summarize, I'd say if you're wanting to build a music lesson business, you know, get really clear on some of the boring stuff. Know those metrics that I said earlier, have a simple funnel. I know that's a popular word these days. Russell Brunson, you know, has, has uh, brainwashed all of us. But um, <laughs> I love Russell, though. He's great. Um, his books are great. His courses are great. Um, his products are great. Yeah, a simple funnel, clearly delineating exactly what you're going to do for them, spoken or written in evocative terms, emotional terms, concrete terms. Um, this is the primary message I give. Um, that's kind of the message I put out there. Like, this is what you need to build. It doesn't have to be overly complex. And and I'll tell you the whole reason I could even build, you know, a global brand out of Grow Your Music Studio, which I realize we're not the biggest online business, not by a long shot, but um, it's a cutthroat industry and we've done really, really well. Um, we've got a, a great team of people, but the only reason I could build that business, you know, this side hustle that then became my full-time thing was because the studio was run so simply and the marketing component of it took up so little of my time. Once I got, you know, some of these things in place, these assets, you know, a website that I barely changed over a seven year period, um, a Google ads strategy that I barely changed over a 10 year period. It, it, you know, these simple things in place allowed me then to focus on other passions, other interests, and, and, and eventually another business. And um, I think that's the message I would give to someone. I love that. So if they've loved what you've been saying today and they want to learn more, how can they connect with you, uh, your website and your socials? 
So um, you can Google Grow Your Music Studio and you'll find our social profiles or you can just go to growyourmusicstudio.com and um, we have tons of free resources there, downloads. Um, and actually, and I'm not sure, uh, but um, if there's a, there's a, one thing, in, there, two things in particular I would point out. We have a Facebook guide for music teachers that has been uh, downloaded quite extensively. That's a really great resource. But I actually um, pull out of the archives a, a presentation I gave many years ago. And you can find that at growymusicstudio.com slash Brie. And so if people wanted to go to that particular uh, link or URL, I guess, um, there's a, a presentation that uh, we haven't made public for quite some time, but it really goes a, a much deeper into a lot of the concepts I'm talking about here. I um, mean, it was a presentation that um, the Music Teachers National Association asked me to present, um, and, I, and I presented it in four different states um, in some of the state conferences that the MTNA puts on. So I um, wanted to specifically point that one out. Awesome. We will include that link, but that is growyourmusicstudio.com slash Brie. Yeah. And I'm going to be also sending out some other resources from Daniel as well, because I know it's going to help the people in our audience that uh, have music studios or, you know, want to start one and grow one. So thank you so much for all of your wisdom today. We really appreciate it. And thank you for, you know, giving of your time and expertise. For sure. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.